Hi everyone, welcome to Nalo's Thrift Talk. I'm Lola. And I'm Nay. And this is our try to on our Kate Spade episode. If you tuned in live, which I know a few of you did, and thank you so much for doing that. We had a few uh, logistical issues. Yes, it's very hard when you're quarantined with kids, alone in the house with kids and a dog, and it's raining out, so you can't send them outside. <laughs> Yeah, so we had a little bit of a, a tough show um, on my end. It was a little crazy. So, so yeah, so we thought that it would be good to do this again. And we are recording at a little after midnight. When everything so everyone is in my house is asleep, so <laughs> the dog included. And if you are new to the show, this is a show all about thrifting and reselling on platforms like eBay and Poshmark and doing it in a way that helps create a sustainable lifestyle. Absolutely. And do you want to say a little bit about this specific episode? Yeah, so Kate Spade has a large following. I'm sure everyone's heard of Kate Spade. And an interesting brand history, as well as we have a personal connection to her, that we'll talk about. So mm -hmm. yeah, so she's, you know, it, it's a great, um, a lot of information, but but really interesting. The whole I, I actually learned stuff while I was researching. So yeah, which always we'll, we'll happens. Tell you what to look for, and yeah, yeah. I always feel like when we do these deep dive shows, we learn so much that we just would never have expected about different designers and brands. So it's always fun. Absolutely. And next. We well in a few days because Absolutely. you know our, our usual Friday time we do have a special episode dedicated to Pride. So we will be talking about different things that you might thrift that appeal to the LGBTQ community, lots of rainbows and pieces of history, ephemera, things like that that are easy to overlook. So you know things that you want to maybe keep an eye out for. Yes, and as an added bonus, it is Lola's birthday. So we're going to be celebrating Lola's birthday too. How and how more appropriate than on our Pride kickoff show? So yeah, it was a nice yeah. Uh, coincidence that my birthday is on a Friday yeah. here. So I've said before, I am a very proud supporter of the Pride cause and Pride Month, and I have friends very near and dear to my heart, like Lola that are members of the LGBTQ community. So, and, and it's, it's just a very, it's a great month. It's, it's about unity and equality and we all need some of that right now. So. Yeah. And I do want to acknowledge that right now, as we were recording this, there are a lot of protests going on all across the country and that as a person of, um, well, a mixed person of color and white passing person of color, I do feel very, I, I do feel it's important to not just pretend like things aren't happening right now. So Black Lives Matter and the first Pride was a riot and we won't forget that as we do our show. Yes, and uh, yes, we do support the cause and Black Lives Matter and equality justice is needed. So before we dive into our main segment today, Nadine, what are you wearing? Let's thrift it. Well, I am, since it's midnight and I'm not very glamorous right now, I'm kind of, you know, hair is a mess. And, uh, this is actually a Gap shirt that I found in the bins. I'm freezing right now. It's comfortable. It's loungy. It's soft. It's worn in. It's flannel. It's cotton flannel. And it's vintage Gap, if you look at the so it's like the sort of better made kind of back when they had really good basics. Turn it. <laughs> Turn I it can with. see it. I can okay. see it. So it's like the old gap. And then underneath, I actually have a pride. It's not actually a pride shirt, but it says miracles do happen. And it's, yeah. That's so, so cute. Yeah. So it's definitely, you know, for, for the kickoff of pride month, I wanted to have something pride. And again, I'm in my loungy, comfy clothes tonight. So, um, sometimes, sometimes the best clothes thrifted are those loungy, kind of broken, comfortable clothes. Yeah, that's what like 
vintage clothes that I wouldn't necessarily list, but are perfectly yeah. worn yeah. in and like threadbare is my oh, favorite. Yeah. Yeah, this has like a hole in the inside collar, like it's worn and I, I would never list it. It's actually a men's shirt, but it's just the most roomy, comfortable, soft shirt ever. So, I definitely have shirts like that. And I feel like I'm wearing your shirt because I'm wearing... I said that. I love, I'm, if you don't know, if you guys don't know, I'm a giraffe fanatic. And I immediately noticed the giraffes on Lola's shirt. Yep. It's awesome. Yep. Is that vintage? Um, it looks so it is it's like 90s okay. it is a plus size so when i list this i will list it as the size it is i know it's really popular right now for people you do to list that i'm buying it from you <laughs> <laughs> well maybe i'll just send it to you then but i did want to to mention that you know um as we talked about on previous episodes that it is hard to find good plus size vintage clothing. And a lot of people nowadays too are listing plus sizes as oversized for smaller people. And it, there is a huge market and it's great to, you know, put, put items on the market that appeal to people who have a hard time finding cute things in their size. So I definitely will say, you know, I might use oversized as a keyword in the description, but I will list this as the size it is on the label, which I do not remember what it is, but I think it's a two or three X. So awesome. Yeah. And our thrift and home decor. Yes. So I have here, and this is an, it is an ashtray, which is kind of, you know, not, you know, it's not like something that I would use or most people would use because you know, smoking has kind of yeah. gone in the way of being icky and unhealthy. So, but it is, it is a vintage Walt Disney um, ashtray. And I think it's cute as, you know, I'll, I'll probably sell it on, on eBay. And it's kind of, it's kind of cute. Like it's, it's got that like um, retro feel. I could see somebody mm -hmm. like putting jewelry in it or something like that, you know, using it as like, Yeah, or holding it on the wall or something. Yeah. And it is made in Japan. So it's definitely well, I hope you it, right? super vintage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So very cool. So I have an item that is not what I shared in our yeah, first one either <laughs> or what we're wearing, but yeah, exactly. And this actually just arrived today. So originally I was thinking I'd save it for Friday, but I'm so happy with it. I have to share. So when we were researching our sewing pattern episode, I discovered that there is a really cool history in my town in Western Massachusetts of silk production. And there, there are lots of factories out here and you see them all over and now they're, you know, trendy loft departments and breweries and stuff like that. But this one silk company actually for a while was run by a utopian community that uh, advocated for abolition and Sojourner Truth lived there for a while. So we have a statue of her. And I found this uh, Victorian trade card from the company, which is called the Florence. Oh, that is awesome. Company. Um, Can you tilt it back a little? There's a little. Yeah, bit. there we go. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So I bought this at an auction. I was the only bidder and it went for 99 cents. Wow. And I paid like $4 shipping. That's so cool because so, it has a sentimental value in your, with your mm -hmm. Yeah. And I will say I would have been willing to pay, you know, probably 10 or $12 for this. So when you have ephemera that um, you're not sure how much it is worth, I would definitely not start it at 99 cents. I'd probably put it up a uh, best offer instead. Um, but I'm really happy that someone was willing to let this go for, for that little, cause I'm, I'm really happy to have it in treasure. It's a very cool piece of history. Yeah, definitely. And it was already framed. Oh, so even better. That's, oh, it was? You didn't frame it? Yeah, no, and it even had the, like this sticker on it says, okay, I don't know who yeah. put it on there. Oh, okay. Probably an ephemera dealer at one point. Right, okay. That says it's an original. Wow. That was a bargain. Yeah. Yeah, I, I almost messaged her to say, you don't have to send the frame, but then I got worried that it would get bent or something. So happy to, I was happy to pay the shipping to make yeah. sure that it came safely. It's fine. And now for our main segment, yeah. all about Kate Spade. And as usual, I definitely want to give Nay most of the credit for researching this episode. So thank you, Nay. And I know you have some really great information to share with us. 
Yeah, so Kate Spade was born Catherine Noel Wozniahan in Wozniahan. In 1962, she was Irish, obviously, and she originally was going to pursue a career in television production. But while she was in college, she worked at a sale at, in sales at a Carter's Men's Shop, which was a clothing store, a men's clothing store in Phoenix. And she met her co-worker, Andy Spade, who happens to be the brother of the actor David Spade there. And later he became her husband and business partner. So in 1986, uh, they moved to Manhattan, and Kate worked in the accessories department at Mademoiselle magazine. She left Mademoiselle in 1991, and by then she had become the senior fashion editor and head of accessories there. So she had a pretty high-ranking position. And while working at the magazine, she noticed that the market lacked stylish, affordable, and sensible handbags, so she decided to create her own. And this is a quote by her, I wanted a functional bag that was sophisticated and had some style. So Kate and Andy founded Kate Spade New York in January 1993. Now, she was not Kate Spade yet because they were not married yet, but they, she decided to take the name because it sounded better than Brosnahan. So. And she did eventually become Kate Spade anyway because she did marry Andy. So, But, yeah, I think that's funny that the brand actually existed before the person, which I, right. I do not know. Yeah. Yes. So she made six prototypes of bags with scotch tape and paper, and she found a manufacturer willing to work as a startup. The manufacturer actually manufactured burlap bags mostly. So she really found, you know, a low cost startup, you know, that was willing to work with her. So after an early show at the Javits Center in New York, um, the department state chain, the department store chain Barney's ordered a few bags and she decided to put the bags labels on the outside, which was a change that took her all night to alter. because She did these you know, mock-ups that were paper and, and, and that kind of established the brand. And the bags were priced economically for designer handbags. You, know, you can think of a Louis Vuitton that's in the thousands. So her bags were priced in the 150 to 450 range. And they became very popular, especially in New York. And they really created a, a fashion shift because everyone had the bags. You could afford them and you could get more than one easily. So, and the company exclusively sold handbags at first, but eventually, as we all know, it did expand to clothing and jewelry, shoes, uh, stationery. There's eyewear, baby items, fragrances, gifts. Um, everything. Yeah. yeah, there's pretty much everything. So in 1996, the brand opened its first boutique, which was 400 square feet in Manhattan, Soho district, and they moved their headquarters to a 10,000 square foot space. It was said that they had a tiny apartment to begin with in Manhattan, and they would, when when they were, all the inventory would come in, all the bags would come in that they were shipping, it took up their entire apartment. So for months at a time, they would have to go stay with friends. They couldn't, they couldn't stay in their own apartment. So <laughs> yeah, so um, they really did start small those stories about like how brands really do start from very, you know, creative kind of bootstrapping yep. ways. Yeah. And then in 1999, Spade sold 56%, a 56% stake in her business to the Neiman Marcus group. And that helped to really establish the brand as a worldwide name. And then in 2004, the Kate Spade home line was launched. And in, by 2006, she sold the remaining 44% to Neiman and Marcus. The group sold the label in 2006 to Liz Claiborne for $124 million. And then it was later renamed Fifth and Pacific. And the company was later purchased by Coach in May 2017. Both Coach and Kate Spade are now part of Tapestry Incorporated. Yeah, so that's another example of how the fashion industry has just gotten very like concentrated in different conglomerates. And when we, when we did the um, Pucci episode, that that's a brand that's also owned by the same luxury umbrella as like yeah, yeah. Louis Vuitton. And yeah, so basically, the big companies just gobble gobble up the brands. Yeah. Um, kind of useful to know when you're um, when you're looking at brands as like the, in relation to each other, because they often have a similar clientele. So yeah, like, it's like Old Navy, oh, Gap, Banana mm -hmm. Republic. Also. Yeah.
and there she is in her that's that's in wonder in her uh in her and mm -hmm. yeah so and you can i love the colors like i was just gonna say that very colorful yeah yeah, it's yeah and she loved color she loved being colorful so and then so after she sold the remaining portion of the ownership of her brand she took several years off to focus on her newborn daughter but in 2016 she launched a new collection of luxury footwear and handbags under the brand name francis valentine so and she did uh collaborate with a friend on that and the brand still exists today um the, the name stemmed from a hybrid of family names so francis is her daughter's name but it was also um, her maternal grandfather's middle name. Oh, no, that was Valentine, I'm sorry. Francis was a family name though, it was, mm -hmm. it was, yeah. And then Valentine was her maternal grandfather's middle name, having been born on Valentine's Day. So later she legally added Valentine to her full name. She did become um, a Kate Valentine after a while because she, it was, you were talking about this a little bit, how she couldn't brand yeah, so there's a there's a great article from Refinery29, which I'll link in the description of this video, and very poignant piece uh, that was published after Kate Spade's death. And it was basically about how, because when she sold her company, she also sold the brand name, that her own name was no longer something that she could use to market her designs, even after you know she started another company. So. Frances Valentine obviously uses neither the name Kate or Spade. And then because that was her name, if she wanted to identify with her own company, she actually had to change her name. Yeah, a little, little, little bit of a gray area too. Like when you're listing a Va Frances Valentine, it's fine to say Kate Spade, even though it's technically, it's Kate Spade, but it's not, but it's right. fine, it's fine but, to use that in the keywords. And and in retail, Kate uh, Francis Valentine could not use the name Kate Spade to market their own products. Yeah, so. exactly. It was it was it was kind of kind of an odd situation. So after she passed away, the brand released a collection of designs called Love Katie in her memory. Um, and she had several years worth of designs and inspirations, and the company is still launching those designs. So yeah, and they definitely harken back to some of the really classic. Kate Spade design. Like you can see her hand in them, which is yeah. If you um, beautiful the other website photos, mm -hmm. and there are some definite. It, it, the the looks are very color block, colorful. You know, they look. They have that Kate Spade kind of hallmark design. So there's yeah. You know, there's some of the handbags. Mm -hmm. You can see the color block look. The the bright yeah. colors. The very bright color. Yeah, design. even the shape of the handbags of reminiscent of mm -hmm. boxier styles and then there again she and some of the the, the handbags the kate spade handbags that go for a lot are the wicker bag so you, know, you can see she brought back the wicker bag and so yeah it, it's very kate spade like you know you can tell mm -hmm. that, that her hand was in it yeah a lot of those the design elements exactly <laughs> And the prices are pretty much in line too. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. They're not over outrageous. So. And, and then there was a line called Kate Spade Saturday, which was a diffusion brand and it was very shortly lived. It had edgier styles at a lower price point. Uh, it closed down in 2015. So if you do find these items in good condition, they're still sought after because they're only available secondhand and they had a short run. So there are going to be people that like that, you know, that like the line and are looking for it. So yeah, and if, if you, I, I wish we, I meant to add some examples, but you can really tell that the designs are very Kate Spade and their and their colors and silhouettes and stuff, but it seems like meant for a completely different woman or a person, or at least in a totally different scenario. So it's not necessarily the like classic work basics, but maybe something you would wear to a really funky party on the weekend or something, hence the name Kate Spade Saturday. So they are very fun and I'm, I'm sad that it didn't do what, do better because. Yeah. yeah. And then another uh, short lived line was Jack Spade, which was the men's line for Kate Spade. Mm -hmm. And those stores were closed in 2015 along with 
Saturday. So uh, again, you can see her, you can see her design there, her, the look, but it's, you know, the masculine designs and a lot of bags that, you know, you have to look for the luggage bags, the briefcases, messenger bags, travel bags. And then also they have, um, they, they did a collaboration with Barber, which is very high end equestrian oriented brand. Mm -hmm. And that coat, you know, went for $399.99, which for a barber jacket is actually a pretty good price, you know, but still that's a great profit if you find one of those uh, while you're thrifting. So. Yeah. I definitely say any barber is a bolo. Yep. And I believe that it's one of those brands where they for many, many years were a very practical, functional brand. Yeah. And then they suddenly started becoming popular for their aesthetic. And in order to meet demand, their quality went down a little bit. So there's also a um, a plus to an older piece if you find one because yeah. they're generally a little bit better made. And then this is uh, yeah, the Gitman Brothers did a collaboration with Zach Spade as well. That's a just a flannel, flannel shirt. It went for sixty five ninety five. So. So definitely worth looking out for the Jack Spade, yep. especially the collabs as well. Yes. And then we're going to talk a little bit about her depression and suicide. Um, so she, uh, her housekeeper found her on June 5th, 2018. Slow's birthday. Um, yeah. But, and she had died by suicide. She left a note for her daughter. Um, the day after her death, Andy Spade, her husband, released a statement that said Kate suffered from depression and anxiety for many years. She was actively seeking help and working closely with doctors to treat her disease, one that takes far too many lives. We were in touch with her the night before, and she sounded happy. There was no indication warning that she would do this. It was a complete shock, and it clearly wasn't her. There were personal demons she was battling. So it just goes to show that, you know, uh, there's, there's a big gap in the um, mental health system and in this, you know, and Lola and I both suffer from mental illness issues. You know, Lola has depression. I have an anxiety. I have anxiety and I'm bipolar. So, you know, and I'm, I'm very vocal about it because, you know, you have to stop, you have to end the stigma and it helps when you talk about it, it helps other people because there's a lot of people that have, these issues, especially at times mm -hmm. like these, you know, it, it even complicates it more. So, mm -hmm. you know, definitely have to, um, you know, it goes to show that if, if you think there's something wrong with someone, with a friend or whatever, you know, actively help them to get to seek help because it's hard. Sometimes it's hard when you're there to get help yourself. You know, it's, it can be really difficult. So. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Like, I definitely have had times when I really needed to say like see a therapist and it was just so hard for me to make the first call and figure it out. So yeah, there are things to do you, that you can help if, if a friend needs it. But I also just totally editorializing for a second um, in his statement when he says that, you know, she sounded happy. There was no indication that she would do this. I, I think that's actually very typical. And when he says it wasn't her, I, Personally, I think that you can't separate out your experience of depression from who you really are. And that's not a bad thing. It's just that people are complicated and you can hold all of these things inside yourself and you can make beautiful, colorful handbags and be depressed. And there's no contradiction there. That's just how it is to be a complex human being like we all are. Yeah, and I think trying to think about depression that way is for me at least, a lot more helpful than trying to say it wasn't her, it was her demons, because it was her. It's a part of, yeah, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a part of who I am. It's, you know, I live with being bipolar every day. I mm -hmm. have medication and I take my medication and I do things that, you know, like therapy and all to combat it, but I still struggle with it every day. It's there. It's a part of who I am, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It never really, it never fully goes away. It, you know, it can be treat it but there's no cure so yeah, exactly so we do have you know a, 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 it's, it's very near and dear to us that mm -hmm. and they did actually Kate Spade that was the photo that she was showing that Lola was showing a minute ago 
that they did donate over a million dollars to um, to causes for uh, mental health awareness. So, and they matched donations from uh, from people. So, and they were you know very vocal in you know suicide prevention, mental health awareness, which I do have to give give the company credit for. Yeah, and I um, I do really love Kate Spade because I think she, her work is just a really great symbol of how you can create beautiful things even if you're, uh, you know, dealing with a lot of painful things inside. Um, yes. And I would love to see a world in which people who are prominent like her can be open and talk about what yeah, they're the doing. There's, really there's a stigma and it has to end. So, yeah, I talk about that a lot. How, you know, and that's why I am vocal. I'm not embarrassed or mm -hmm. that I have a disease. Just like, you know, if I had any other disease, I would have to take medication for it. I'd have to, you know, and I wouldn't be embarrassed of that. So. Totally. Totally. And on that note, speaking of the beautiful things that she made, here are some of the exquisite bags that if you ever find in a thrift store, you are incredibly lucky. Yeah. So this is the Chinese, take, the Chinese takeout bag, which went for $795 on Poshmark. This is one of the, the Holy Grail bags. So there's a lot of figural bags. They're kind of 3D. They're very whimsical. They're very creative, very fun. And those bags are definitely what you want to look for. So mm -hmm. this is a card catalog set. And like Lola had said, it, that this is post card catalog time, you know, so it was kind of like a throwback retro thing. Yeah. And so creative to see that shape and think, oh, I can make that into a purse. Yeah. And then here's another one that was a, unicorn a balloon a clutch which went for six hundred dollars so much fun it's like one of those twisty balloons you know yeah it's like a jeff coons inspired yeah yeah that's true yeah and then here's one that this is the by the pool line that went for six hundred seven dollars there is this is a pineapple bag there's also a flamingo bag in that line that goes for quite a bit so. yeah and this is so i didn't notice this before but it's actually pieces of leather that are like sculpted together. Okay. I don't know why I thought it was um, maybe like plastic, more like like a solid piece of plastic, but it's actually pieced together. Yeah, very mm -hmm. cool. And then this is one of the wicker bags. This is the camel bag. That, and there's a whole bunch of the wicker bags you'll see in the next photo. There's an alligator one. This one went for $500 on eBay. Oh. And then there awesome. is, yeah, these are some of the other ones with the piano bag. Cars. I just, they're so, so much fun. And you can see the prices are just crazy what they go for, you know. And originally they sold for a lot less, but the demand. So the prices are, are, are all above and beyond what they would have been in yeah, stores. Exactly. But they're so rare that, you know, the collectors are looking for them now. So. And then the typewriter bag is a huge polo. That's one that you definitely should look for. And. I think there's a blue version of the typewriter bag as well. This one, you know, I, it was a best offer. You know, they had it up for 1500 I would imagine that it went for over 1000 for sure. So, and then you see the Volkswagen, the Beetle bag, the Beetle bag, so cute. Super cute. Yeah. I love that there's the matching wallet, card yeah. holder, and coin purse. Yeah. And a lot of these do have matching, you know, clutches or coin. So if you find mm -hmm. the whole set, you have a bonus. You know. Yeah, that's a good point. And then there's mm -hmm. the alligator wicker bag, which is so adorable. So cute. Six ninety nine. And then there's, you can see th those are not figural bags, but they're still very whimsical. There's the peacock bag and the constellation bag. They still went for, you know, in the six and seven hundreds. So. Yeah, and the peacock actually, oops. Oh, and there's the T-Rex. Uh, the, pe the peacock tail comes off the bottom of the bag, right? Yes, I think yeah. that, yes, yes. So it's sort yeah. of a yeah, straddle. Sort of, sort of, yeah. Yeah. And then the T-Rex bag is another really popular one. I mean, how how could it not be? It's adorable. And they get, they fetch, 
good prices on eBay and Poshmark. I think some of them do a little bit better on Poshmark, actually, some of the, the really sought out bags, but they can do well on both platforms. And it could be something that you want to auction, but mm -hmm. if you auction those, I would start very high. Yeah, that makes sense. In general, I found that I have better luck selling Kate Spade on Poshmark than on eBay. Um, yes, I do as well. Yeah. Listen, now I'll cross list it, and almost every time it sells first on yep. on Poshmark. Yeah. So absolutely, I agree. Yeah. And yeah, another uh, set of bolos to look for are the collabs, which is often true with brands, and it's also true with Kate Spade. So this is one example. Yeah, Disney. She did a Disney line, and it was all Minnie Mouse. It's all Minnie Mouse. So cute. So, yeah. So yeah. And you, this is a, a great example of when a collab opens up your market to two different groups because not only do you have the people who love Kate Spade and love her colorful designs, but then you also have people who are looking for a special bag to take on a special trip to Disney World or you know just someone who's a Disney collector. Absolutely. And they, I don't know, if they still. Too, but these bags were sold at Disney too. Mm. Are they, they were exclusively at Disney? I believe so. They were Disney. I know they were Disneyland, probably I assume Disney World too, but mm -hmm. they were sold at Disney. So I don't know if they're exclusively Disney or but they were definitely sold at the park. So and then mm. another Minnie Mouse. Yeah, that's the whole set. The Minnie, Minnie Mouse. You can see the cute bows and yeah, so adorable. And that whole set went for five minutes. So. Super cute. And, and then, then this is more of a bridal leaning well, Yeah, so Keds, she did a collaboration with Keds, and they, the bridal sneakers were priced at around $100, $100 a pair. So she did a line because, you know, the brides like the, you know, the decorated fun sneakers, and so she, there was a market for it. So she created that. And there are some other Keds collabs that are not the bridal sneakers but the bridal ones are you know the big bolos but but there's definitely some other she did she did other heads designs that were non-bridal and then dr shoals did a line these are so cute i love it i love dr shoals sandals i did not know that there was a kate spade collab so now kind of want some yeah so cute so that's another one to look for and this is Target, Kate Spade, Target. And the Target line is all for iPhone, cell phone accessories, um, Apple Watch bands, chargers, things like that, you know, like cases and AirPod mm -hmm. cases, I'm sorry. Uh, so you can see those, those designs. And that that's a recent collaboration. It's in the stores right now, so. I was gonna say, it looks like the current iPhone. No, I had a Kate Spade iPhone case and it lasted me like three years. It was so well made. So I don't know how these are, you know, because they're marketed for Target. Right. I don't know if they've, um, but you know, they're they're super oh, cute though. Nice. And then Magnolia is another uh, handbag brand, and this was you know kind of a, a yeah. I was surprised. This is a recent sold, and I think of Magnolia as something that was like really trendy when it was on Sex and the City, which was now like quite a while ago. So apparently there's still Magnolia fans. There are better cupcakes in New York, by the way. So this one went for, that one went for 74. 75, yeah, which is not bad for a, a tote. Yeah, exactly. It looks like it's vinyl, not leather. I'm not sure, it might be, or vi uh, vinyl with the leather patch. It looks like it, yeah, it looks mm -hmm. like it's vinyl, yeah. And she authored, and then, wrote, she authored three books. So, I'm mad about this one because I used to have those books yeah. and I think we just donated them at some point. Well, if you find them, they don't go for a lot singular, but you might want to keep a, keep them and read them too or have a coffee table book. But the set, if you can find all three, the set does go for about $30, as you can see. So Yeah, I think I paid less than that for each book. So could have could have made a small profit like 20 years later. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you find them in the bins or something, that's a great yes. thing. And, and then, then vintage, vintage bags. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the vintage bags. So they are, a lot of them were nylon. And 
they one of her first designs was called the Sam bag, and it was a nylon boxy bag, and it merged sleekness with practicality. That's like the one on the top there. And just recently, the company announced that it was going to be bringing that bag back with a few modern updates, which is really cool. And there is a market for them for the vintage bags on multiple platforms. They don't seem to do as well on Poshmark. They do okay on eBay. Actually, Etsy has a has a good following for the vintage Kate Spade bag. So that's something you might want to consider. These are sold from eBay. You can see. I mean, still not bad. I mean, you can pick one up for not a lot at the thrift stores and it's a pretty good yeah. profit. So, and these are also, I mean, they were widely faked, but they were so badly faked that it's pretty easy to tell when you have a real one. Yes, exactly. But it's funny you said that they're creating some like modern updates because I know I had a bag like one of these that had a pocket in it for like a Nokia cell phone. Oh, that's so funny. So obviously yeah. not quite useful anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that is always funny when you find those vintage bags with like the the old school uh, accessories. <laughs> yeah. So these are some of the some of the ones. These aren't sold, but these are some of the prices that the bags are you know selling at around. Um, for on Etsy, you can see like you know some of them are going. Some of them are priced at you know like a hundred, two hundred dollars, seventy five. You know, and I think I think the prices. It looks like the prices on Etsy are. Um, are a little higher you get a little more on Etsy because it's which is usually the case for vintage yeah. so that doesn't surprise me I could also see listing on eBay at some of these prices and then expecting to take an offer for you know list at 70 take an offer for 55 or something right and then mm -hmm. this is very cool speaking of, of pride month right now so Kate Spade did, they have, um, right now on the website, it's actually um, live now, it's called the Rainbow Shop. And you can purchase Kate Spade, the rainbow items. And they are donating it to um, the Trevor mm -hmm. Project, which supports the mental well-being of LGBTQ youth. So very, it's a very good cause. And yeah. I think, I love, I love the designs, very cool. I do like this one. Yeah, it's so cute. It's so cute. So I love that they do that for, you know, for to celebrate pride and to help the LGBTQ community, especially you know the youth youth in the youth in the community. You know they. Yeah, it's still, um, still very. Even though things have gotten a little bit easier, there's still lots of kids. When absolutely, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. And. Some of the other items are home goods. And well, you have some of these current, or not these exactly, but you have some. I have, yeah, I, and I forgot to grab one of my plates, but I do have some Christmas plates that I listed. I think I listed them a little too late, a little too close to Christmas last year, so they didn't sell. Still have a lot of interest in them. Haven't had any takers yet, but I think as it gets closer to this holiday season, I think they'll sell. So I have about six of them, and I paid only a few dollars each and you can see they're not going to go for this much but you can see you know this china set and this was discontinued uh these pieces went for 490 dollars so that is a lot you know for, yeah. for i can also dollars. see this is like a popular um pattern to register for for your wedding and so yeah. if someone had it as their wedding china and they break a plate or they oh, just yeah one the plate point. setting then they're willing to go and, and pay a little bit more to have the matching set. So yes, and there's a lot of home goods. There's you know comforters and you know see there teapots and dishes and you know there's just everything Kate Spade that you can pick up. And some of the comforter sets and the and you know the sheets and all can go for a lot too. So definitely look for those. And yeah, and I'll say it. I don't do like a ton of retail arbitrage, but. If I'm at like TJ Maxx or Michael or Michael's Marshalls, sometimes I'll come across yeah. Kate Spade home goods stuff. And a lot of them are very plentiful, but once in a while you will find that item that somehow made its way there, but is going for a, a chunk on, you know, on eBay or Poshmark. So it's always worth keeping an eye out. Yeah. And jewelry is another thing that you can see. And the jewelry is also very whimsical and figural. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, you can see the, uh, the, the taco truck 
Oh, I want the taco truck. That's so cute. The taco truck. That's so cute. The pineapple, you know, and they go for quite a bit too, as you can see. So if you, mm -hmm. you know, if you find some of those, whim especially the whimsical ones, you know, definitely. Yeah, the more novelty, just like with no novelty prints, are always like a good, exactly, a good bolo. So anything novelty like that, someone's going to be looking for it. Yes, and uh, there's a bracelet that's a throwback. It's to the to the Beastie Boys. It's no sleep till Brooklyn. So it's a Bengal bracelet. And, and another nod to New York. The yeah, the taxi shoes, and these are one of the shoes that is, um, you know. A big kind of a one of the bigger bolos is, is the taxi flat so super yeah, so again the like novelty kind of unexpected exactly and then the clothing there's a dress that went for 450 and that's super cute so the hummingbird pattern you know some of the prints i sold a dress a kate spade dress that was you know kind of like a color black dress and i sold it for over a hundred dollars, I paid eight ninety nine for it. You know, so that was a while ago. But you know, if you ever find them, definitely pick them up. So, yeah, I mean, this is definitely one of the higher price but items. But I get that for all of all of the dresses. Yeah, but it's I, I every time I find a Kate Spade dress, I've sold it for at least I think eighty was maybe the cheapest. That oh I've yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So yeah. definitely worth worth picking up. And then this is one of your solds. This is one of my solds. It is a pair of shoes. Now these were super tiny. They were like a size five and a half or something. They were so tiny. And they did have some condition issues, like the bottom of the heel, um, you know, it was, it was really worn and probably needed some resoling. You know, the bottoms mm -hmm. were, were, in, were pretty, you know, they were pretty banged up. And then it had, they had some scuffs on them and all. So I did, I did sell them for 35 and they would have sold for more. I think if they were not only if they were larger size, but if they were in better condition and you know, I did get positive, a positive feedback. You know, she was actually really thankful that I had listed all of the condition issues. So. Yeah. So I think this is one brand where I would pick up something flawed and take the time yeah. to do, especially like, did you find these at the bins or yeah, these, these were from the bins. So that's why I got them. You know, they were in rough condition, but and it was worth it. You yeah. take the time yeah, to. She can get them, you know, rehealed. She can get that fixed and have, you know, a great pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. And even like you can tell from this photo that you have to look up pretty close to see the flaws. Yeah, and most of them were on the bottom. So yeah, so if you're wearing them like one night to a wedding or something, no one's gonna notice exactly. Yeah. So and then this is one of the nylon bags. Now this is an outlet bag. Uh, correct, Lola. I those. believe so. Yes. So the the um, the piece of leather that is um, buck like snapped on or not snapped on. What's the right word? Rivets on the bag yeah. is an indication that it is a outlet bag. And there is also sometimes a sort of a silhouette of the spade logo instead of the like positive spade will also indicate that it is a outlet bag. And then you can compare it to, so this is one actually did pull out of the bin. So good example of when, you know, take the time to clean it. It does need a little bit more cleaning, but what once, you know, the, a lot of the wear on these bags I find is just surface wear and it'll come off with a good leather cleaner. So, you know, don't overlook bags just because they look totally trashed. I but you can see here where the logo is directly uh, yeah. on the leather. So this is a, a regular like department store yeah. or, or Kate Spade store bag. So I won an auction for like 20 something dollars on Shop Goodwill and that, that bag yeah. up there was in the lot. It was two, two Kate Spade bags and then this bag, which is not an outlet bag, you can see. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not an outlet bag, but it's, it's, mm -hmm. it does have some condition issues. It needs to be cleaned up, but the leather is really soft. It's, you know, it's, you can tell it's good mm -hmm. quality. It has a lot of ink marks on it. And then the it inside is really needs some cleaning up, but the lining you can see is striped on the inside. It does have the spade, little spade. Uh, so I had a bag like that. It was 
almost the same design. It was gray leather, but it looks like the same kind of uh, pebbled leather. Mm -hmm. I bought it retail, but deeply on sale at Nordstrom's and it was maybe 130, I think. Okay. I carried it for two to three years and then I realized it was sitting in my closet. So I listed it on Poshmark and I sold it for over a hundred dollars. Wow. So I don't know what else, but I, you know, it doesn't even, like I said, it does have some condition issues as far as. I mean, mine did too though. And I disclosed them and, and this was a couple of years ago. So the market may have changed, but yeah. definitely it is something that, you know, people are, if you disclose the issues, I think people are willing to, to buy them because they, they know that these bags really do hold up yeah. over time. So this one is another one that I have. This one came from the bins and it was in pretty rough condition. I washed it. I actually I threw the whole thing in the wash, which I know is a little controversial. I mean, I probably wouldn't have done it if it was a, you know, wasn't a bins bag. Yeah. Now, this was already happening to the, the strap, but the other strap is fine. And it came out really good. It's, and this is called the, what is the, the, That's the Dot Noel print. Okay. Yeah. So this is a popular print that you'll see. And it's actually her initials simplified, the K and the mm -hmm. F simplified. So, and yeah, so cool. the inside of the bag also has that design. Mm -hmm. It's really cute. So this bag, you know, this is an example of one that I got at the bin. Now I'm using this for my personal use, but you know, I could probably still sell it for a decent price even. You know, even with the strap issue, because yeah, because you could have it replaced, fine. or you could just remove it if you wanted to, and use exactly, it. yeah. So, but it's in, you know, and it also has on the bottom, mm. New York. So, and this is also an outlet bag, I think. Because yeah. So from so the two things on that one, you can tell is that it doesn't have a um, metal feet, which not every bag does. This one doesn't, but it's something yeah. that's generally emitted. It's a detail that's emitted on the um, outlet, outlet bag. And then the, the like placket instead of directly on the bag. I also have, I have these shoes that these are super cute. They're wedge heels. They do actually fit me, which is a kind of a, a bummer and a bit. So I haven't listed them, I think, because I know they fit me and, but Practically, I'm not going to be wearing these anywhere anytime soon. I might as well just sell them. So I'm probably them so they can have like a cruise or something. I always feel bad keeping yeah. things like that. Or I'm like, they should go live their life. And I, I'm just leaving them in my closet. Yeah, exactly. Because I'm, you know, really, I don't have an occasion. And then this is an example of the clothing, a clothing item. It is a, just a top, but you can see that color block pattern mm -hmm. on it. And it's got those cute buttons on the front. So very, very Kate Spade looking. And see, it's got, it doesn't have a tag on it. It's got the, just the, um, the print on the fabric. So. And, and so when you're listing a few things that you want to include are some, some things we've already mentioned, the pattern. So if it has that Doc Noel pattern, that's one thing that people look for. The pattern of the inside lining. So you can, you know, keep have a photo of this and describe it if if you can. So this one just says Kate Spade New York over and over again. Yes. The the leather and the color and the silhouette of the bag all have names. And so yes. they're hard to find figure out there's no like one database that I've found like you know how um so for Lily Pulitzer prints you can kind of go on Pinterest and find a pin board of like yeah. everything ever I do find though if you find a bag you kind of describe the shape kind of describe and then if you look at other things that are listed you can sometimes get clues yes. from that yeah that's exactly what I've done that seems like the easiest thing to do is Sometimes you can either find a similar bag on the website, the retail website, or uh, another listings like on, on sold on Poshmark or eBay. So, and yeah. it's not the end of the world if you can't figure it out, but it's one of those things like Lululemon where if you do have that keyword, if you know what the style is, it yeah. will help people find what they're looking yeah. for. Like I had mentioned vintage sandbags, you know, like that. Yeah. So yeah, so definitely. And 
like Lola said, the material is very mm -hmm. important. To this oh, and then the, the color of the metal too is the hardware. Good. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the lining. I think you mentioned mm -hmm. the lining. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So <clears throat> we are going to describe the. Um, I'm sorry. We're gonna describe. It is twelve thirty. So <laughs> actually, it's almost one. So a few things to look for when you're trying to make sure that a bag is authentic. Yeah, so authenticating case. There were a lot of fakes in the 90s and early 2000s, especially in the nylon bags. And there's a lot less fakes flooding the market, but you know, like everything out these days, but like everything else, you know, everything can be counterfeited. So, um, so some of the things to look for are um, the logo and the stamping on the case mm -hmm. of the bags is, is the easiest way to assure the authenticity. So they use four types of labels, the embossed, the fabric, the stamp, and then the metal inlay. And they generally appear on the front top or the bottom of the handbag. You can see on some of the examples that, that we've just shown. And as I mentioned earlier, the bags from the 90s, some of them were just so bad that it is pretty easy to tell right away that there's something wrong with the label. Yeah. But you can usually tell when, especially those bags, when something's off because the spacing will be off. The letters will not all be in the proper upper or lowercase. So Kate Spade, her name should be in lowercase. And then New York is uh, is uh, capitalized or uppercase? I just really thought I knew it was that way. Capitalized. Well, and, and these, it's, yeah. So sometimes it is depending on how old it is, I think. But the Kate Spade will always lower, be lowercase. Yeah. So if you see any capital letters, the Kate Spade's name, then yeah. you know that it is not. And, but in my experience, and this was back in the days when she was still making those bags and I would look for them in thrift stores, you could find that they were fake pretty clearly just by Oh yeah, the, that's a lot of them yeah. are really horrific fakes. Yeah, um, it'll be like the spacing, the kerning will yeah. be off on the And letter. then another thing is the fabric labels will always be stitched on and never glued on. A lot of the fakes had glued on labels that you can almost just peel right off. Mm -hmm. like, so yep. if, yeah. it's, if it's glued on, then you know it's a fake. And I mean, I used to find them, I remember not so much anymore because they're not as flooded now, but as you know, like years back when I was thrifting, I would find them all over the thrift stores constantly, always find the, the ones with the glued on labels mm -hmm. that are not fake. So. Yeah, and the glue would always be like yellowing and flaking yeah. off. Yeah. It's like really easy to give away. Um, the other stamps will display the same lo logo as the fabric labels. So the logos on every material should be straight and clear with, with the consistent spacing, which you mentioned. And then the nylon and the canvas should have a smooth te texture free of bumps and inconsistent Mm -hmm. The stitching should always be straight. Some of the older bags may not have engraved hardware, so that's not necessarily an indicator, but a lot of them do. Um, the zippers are unbranded with smooth bottoms. And then the authentic Kate Spade bags have been produced in eight countries. Actually, there's not, there is a ninth. So, USA, Italy, China, Taiwan, Dominican Republic, Indonesia. Vietnam and the Philippines, and they did do a special wine that was manufactured in Rwanda. So you would, you know, maybe think that was fake, but it's, but you know, there there is a legit wine that was manufactured there. And a lot of the handbags that were produced before 1996 will not display an origin label, but all of them that were produced after 1996 will have one. So you know, if it doesn't have one, that it is. 1996 or previous and most of the nylon bags made between 96 and 2002 were, were made in the USA some were made in Taiwan but most were made in the USA and they'll have a tag that says you know, with, a, with an American flag that says made in the USA in all uppercase under the flag um, most of the leather suede and calf hair bags are produced in Italy but the made in Italy tag Varies, and the majority of the bags made after 2002, with the exception of the leather bags, are made in China and Indonesia. So a lot of you know, this is a high chance that if you have one with China and Indonesia, that it was after 2002. So, and each origin tag is usually sewn into the seam of the interior zip pocket. 
Um, and then if you want to talk a little bit about the outlet versus retail bag, which we've touched on. Yeah, I think I think we covered the main the main points and you know the outlet as with you know Nadine, your sold example, they do sell, but it just may be for a little bit. Yeah, little bit. yeah, if that was a non outlet bag, I knew it would sell for more, but still yeah. I mean you know, I paid half of that for two bags. Yeah, you got a great deal. And then yeah. the and the other bag is worth even more. So I did pay shipping on top of that. So I mean it was but still I made a great profit, you know, and I was I'm yeah. happy. Yeah. And the other bag I will I will get to selling. I just want to clean it up a little bit. So and then but, I was gonna say we have one great bonus fun fact about Kate. Yes, if you wanna tell. Yeah. So she loved flea markets and thrift stores and would often go hunting for inspiration for her design. So when we sell any of her bags online, we are sort of completing the circle and yes, exactly. and, yeah, reselling um, in some of the same places she may have looked for, for uh, inspiration and also buying them from places where she looked for inspiration. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. Very cool. So that is our main segment. And as always, we have a couple final segments to wrap up our episode. And you know you had some good sales to share, Nadie. This one. Yeah, so these were a, a pair of fun shorts. They had anchors on them. They're men's size seven extra large, which is a harder size to find, you know, if, if for, you know, if you're that size, it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to shop online probably, and it's going to be harder to find something kind of cute and whimsical like this in a, in that size. So I hopefully made somebody's day. I did get positive feedback already for it. And, you know, they, they paid $24.99 plus shipping. They did have to go priority because you know, they're very large and they were, they did actually weigh like, almost a pound. Oh, wow. So did you put them in a flat rate envelope or a... I put them in a pad. I just shipped them in a pad. Yeah. 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 That seems like the easiest thing. Yeah. they. I mean, I think they could have probably gone under a pound, but they were like kind of borderline, you know. Yeah. So I just did the prior to shipping. And I sold a lot of... Now, this was a lot. I was talking about possibly listing these individually on Etsy, but the problem was so many of them, and I did show, show a lot of these in the sewing pattern episode, a lot of them had really, you know, the, the envelopes were in varying, various conditions. Some of the paper was really deteriorating on them, and some of them were completely, like, ripped. And and then some of them were uncut, but some of the, a lot of them were cut. And I just, I mean, I have so much to list, and I just did not feel like going through all of the cut ones and counting the pieces. And so what I did was I just listed it as a whole lot of 23, and I said, and I disclosed not sure of all the pieces, you know, some of them are cut, some of them are uncut, the envelopes are, you know, in various conditions. I listed a lot for 99 and she mm -hmm. offered 60, I countered at 75 and she accepted. So I paid not for bad. it and sold for yeah, 75. Now I did have to pay, I did do free shipping on that. So I did have to pay shipping on top of that. Mm -hmm. It was, I, they went in a medium flat rate box. So um, 12. Yeah, it's about twelve dollars. So you know, it's not too bad. Not too bad. So basically, I got what like she was offering her original offer, and I, when I countered, I covered the shipping and then some. So yeah, and I think this is a good example of when you really have to value your time because if you had taken the time to count all the pieces of all of these and listed them and sold them and packaged them up individually, you wouldn't have made as much probably. Yeah. If you're paying yourself, you know, yeah, a minimum wage even for, you know, per hour. So yeah. now I could have, there were a few in there that were in good condition and they were on cut and could I have sold those for, you know, maybe 10 bucks a piece or so? Yes, absolutely. But again, you know, like I threw them into the lot to make it, you know, cause you have to have some good items in there too. So yeah. And I think that's a nice way to, to make it more attractive to buyers and then also just 
a couple more items. You don't have to worry about listing individually. So, yeah. so, so I have, have and I have plenty of other sewing patterns left. So I might actually even do another lot if I have so many. So, and then this was a great one. Yeah, this is an unexpected bolo, not to Lola and I, but to you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a so the, the cone yarns. This was a two pound cone, huge, enormous. Um, a lot of yarn. Yeah, a lot of yarn. And this Filpucci name we talked about in our yarn episode. It is, they make yarn for very, very high end designers sourced from Filpucci and also, um, you know, lower end designer, but their higher end item. Uh, Banana Republic has a line of sweaters that will say Italian, made, the tag says something like made with Italian Filpucci. You know, yarn and so a lot of people didn't know the name and I sold the cone now Lola said I could have gotten a little more for it and I probably could have because it sold very fast the thing is I had like four others and in the past the prices were going for about 50 so I based this on what I sold the others for but I didn't know Lola had a little tip that is it the merino wool or the mohair it is the mohair so okay. right now Mohair yarn is very popular in the knitting world. And generally when you use mohair, you don't use it by itself. You hold one strand of it alongside another, maybe like a merino yarn. The most popular blend is mohair and silk. So that's that's not this, but honestly, it doesn't really matter because it is so expensive. And this is more than enough to knit a whole sweater. So this was a great deal. You know, someone was probably looking to knit one of these sweaters that if they had bought just the mohair yarn by itself, it could have easily been like $120, $150. So this is, you know, basically half of that. And they'll have plenty of yarn left over. So if you find mohair, in particular, when when you have a cone like this, the yarn is very, very thin. So if it's yeah. a new fiber you really can only use it for machine knitting. It's hard to use in hand knitting, but this this kind of yarn you could use for hand knitting. Okay. So that opens up your audience a little bit more. Yeah, so, and that goes to show that, you know, trends, things, trends, yeah. trends change over time. So, you know, I listed the others and I happened to find another one in my prop pile that I didn't, I didn't realize I had. So the others I sold like over a year ago. And at that time, that's about, the going rate. So I didn't take the time to look up, you know, look them up again. So I figured it would go for about the same. But had I, or had I consulted Lola, I would have known that, you know, the trend that mohair was trending right now. And I could have sold it for a little more, but still very happy with the still, still a great flip. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a good thing to remember that trends exist in niches that you have no idea even exist. So, yeah. you know, I happen to be a knitter, so I know and I follow the trends in the knitting world. But if I wasn't, it would never have occurred to me, like, I'm, I don't know anything about like model trains, but I bet if one of you is watching this and it's all about model trains, oh, yeah. you'd probably tell me about something trending that's worth Absolutely. more than you would be on, you know, secondhand. So it's always good to do your comps and, and to, to, brush up your knowledge now and then because things can change. Absolutely. Oh, the other tip too, I, it's hard to see because it's so tiny, but my third photo or fourth photo in, I do put it, I with these, I put them on the scale and I show yes. the weight. I have a picture of the weight. You know, that's yes, the weight. that is a great thing to do for, not only for cones, but even for if you have skeins of yarn that don't have a label mm -hmm. or that um, sometimes older vintage yarn will give you a, a non-standard measurement of what's in it. So putting the weight gives people a better idea of what the yeah. yardage will be and how much is there. Oops. And so I have been making masks just nonstop. And I, you know, I do have a few sales on, on eBay and Poshmark, but I did want to take this little soapbox to talk about my masks. Um, so I've been using all kinds of items from my personal thrifted stash and a few things from my death pile. And this, this is one that I made. It's, it's a little imperfect. It has a little imperfection on the nose. So I kept it for myself. 
This was from a vintage uh, sari that was made for a, the, a tourist market. It actually had the tag on inside. So I was able to look it up and see where it came from. And I think it was from the 60s, but it was hard to tell because it looks like that particular market had been around for just you know decades and decades. So it could have been almost any time. And uh, this is the one I wear while I'm working. Um, so. I like the shape of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really pretty. I don't know if I could have cut up the sari though. Well, it was stained and I- Okay, the so there's a good example of the same. Yeah. Now Lolo was asking me the other day about uh, a beautiful yeah. antique Hawaiian dress that she was, and she's like, should I cut it up? And I was like, no, Don't. you should not. You, you need to list that. So. Yeah, I mean, I have gone through so much fabric that I definitely started eyeing things in my closet. Yeah, in, in my I, I stopped you though. At least. Really I stopped the, the destruction of a beautiful. <laughs> but I can, but I can see if something's stained or if it's got holes or if it's got that. That it's a great way to repurpose. It is, yeah, and give it give it a second life and um and just be you know eco friendly and I am washing everything very carefully so it's all disinfected before I, I sew with it so if anyone is looking for masks still I am selling them in order to cover my costs for donating them and I'm donating them to some of the um, native communities and farm workers who are still in need of them so please get in touch if you're interested. I'd love to sell you a mask and it would help me continue to do the work I've been doing, which it's just, honestly, it's somewhat selfish because it's so hard to go through these times and, and not be doing something. And as I'm a maker, I always want to be, I always want my hands to be moving. So masks. <laughs> okay. And as always, we do have a question for everyone. And we'd love to know your Kate Spade finds. So I know, I think I talked about this in our original version of this and not this time, but I have a really special memory of when I was a teenager and I worked for a camp over the summer and I saved up my money all summer to buy my first first hand from the store Kate Spade bag. And it was just a real moment of pride because I felt like I had, you know, all my hard work had paid off and I bought it all on my own. And I know probably a lot of other people my age have similar yeah. memories. Yeah. They were, Kate Spade was first popular when I was in like middle and high school. So, yeah, you know, so share, we'd love to hear your story. If you have a great thrift find or a great flip or, you know, anything like that, um, tell us in the comments and please like and subscribe to our channel if you found this information valuable and we have a whole catalog of ish of episodes where we do deep dives like this on different brands and different topics so if you like this video hopefully you will also enjoy our others yes. and we will be back on friday just a few days from now with our next episode which will be a special edition for pride and lula's birthday and my birthday <laughs> So we hope we will see you there and try to pull up a photo. But I'm disorganized tonight. Yeah, that'll be fun though. Yeah. And I have a really cool background, and we will, I will be wearing another pride item. And yeah, so mm -hmm. super fun, colorful, and you know, obvious. And at this time again, you know, celebrating equality and equal rights for all, and you know, all of that. Everything that Pride stands for is, you know, what everyone needs to be, you know, needs to be thinking about right now, I think. So. Absolutely. So we'll see you then. Bye, everyone.